This week we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be in verses 3 through 8, and we're going to deal with one of those extra long sentences of Paul's. Now I first have to issue an apology and a retraction. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this, we got started on this, this chapter, I said that the sentence was from verse 3 to verse 17. That is incorrect. Uh, that Sunday night, after I had said the foolish thing that I said, uh, because it actually stops in verse 8, was because I had drawn a line through the period in my Bible. Remember we talked about putting notes in your Bible? Be careful. Be careful when you do that or you end up standing up here like me looking like an idiot because you drew a line through the period at the end of the sentence. So anyway, there is a period at the end of sentence 8, which means that's the sentence. Now still, look at verse th verse 3 to verse 8. That's a hoss of a sentence. And you know the next sentence goes from verse 9 all the way to verse 17. That's another hoss of a sentence, right? So we're going to talk about this morning, the, the importance of sentence structure and punctuation. And all of you guys who skipped out on English class, it's going to come around to bite you. I remember English class, I had a really good English teacher, Mrs. Wood, if you're out there I appreciate you. Um, she was awesome. Uh, it was probably the most fun and entertaining classes that I had. And she, was a, she really was a very good teacher. But you don't think you're ever going to use sentence diagramming in your real life. You ever go meet a lawyer? You're going to need sentence diagramming because they'll steal you blind if, they, if you don't know how to read a sentence. Uh, you ever read a politician's doublespeak? Same thing. Read the newspaper, find out where the lie is. You better understand sentence structure and punctuation because they'll steal you blind if you don't. So uh, understand that understanding is a big deal. So as, uh, as we have said before, we're going to be here in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 through 8. <clears throat> and we'll read it and then I'm going to come back and we'll pray and then we'll get into the message. Verse 3 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ." who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray this morning that we would follow the example of the Apostle Paul by praying in hope for other believers. Lord, this morning we're going to see how important that prayer life is and how that no matter who we're dealing with and, and what choices they make in life, we always have hope in you. Lord, I pray that this would be our understanding this morning as we come through this and as we learn some of the things that it takes to be able to understand and know the scriptures intimately. I ask this in Jesus' name and for his honor and glory's sake. Amen. All right. So one of the subtle dangers that we get um, by being preachers and preaching the word of God and teachers of the word of God is teaching the Bible without applying the Bible, right? You have to be careful to make the application. And we believe in every Sunday, we do use a method of preaching here called expository preaching, where you expose the word of God to the people, and thus the word of God exposes the people to God, right? That's the whole thing that, that we're supposed to do. We don't study so that we can tell you what you want to hear. We want to show you what the word of God says so that you hear what he says. And then that tells you what's going on in your heart. That's how it works. He is, his, his word is a sword. It's sharper than any two edged sword. So as you dissect the word of God, it dissects you and exposes your internal faith or your lack thereof. Look in Hebrews. 
See, he has every right, more right than most, to have his voice heard. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 through 13 says, Let us therefore, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So this has to do with faith and belief and following him, right? He says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is any creature, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So what happens is, is as the word of God dissects you and you dissect the word of God, and you start taking it apart. It takes you apart in the process and lays open your insides for you to see. The fact is he knows what's in there already. You don't know what's in there. So that's the issue. And that's why we use what's called expository preaching. So I'm going to take you through exposing what the word of God says and the process that you have to go through to get there this morning. So, because what it will do is it will lay open for you Paul's relationship with the church at Colossae and show you how he's praying for them and why he's praying, what he's praying specifically. If you don't pay attention to the details, you'll miss it, okay? And you'll get a message that the Word of God doesn't teach and thus not have your heart exposed and not learn what you ought to learn. And that's, that's, the, that's the issue. It's, it's extremely important. So if we're going to be faithful to undergo, undergo the knife, we must allow in faith that these corrections that he makes in us are real and necessary for us to understand and to acknowledge and to alter our lives accordingly. So remember, Colossae means the punishments, right? And the Laodicean church ain't right, to use the common colloquial term, they ain't right even though she is loved just like the church at Ephesus. Revelation 3.19, turn over there. Revelation 3.19, and that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. He's been expressing his love and his relationship for them, which is his right to speak to their issues. He has a relationship with them. He has bought them with a price. They have received his grace and mercy. Therefore, he has a right to speak to Laodicea's issues, okay? So what does he say, Revelation 3, 19? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That is the relationship of the church of Laodicea and the church of Colossae. Colossae is the one that receives the rebuke. Laodicea is the one who does not receive the rebuke, okay? Or at least hasn't yet. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay, so that's the issue with the church of Laodicea. So this morning, as we apply the word of God to ourselves, we are going to expose the fact that Paul was only hearing about the Colossians faith and hope secondhand. Right. He had never been there. The se and here's the thing. Secondhand information is risky if it's not true. He's only hearing about their faith and their love. He doesn't know for certain that they have faith and that they have love, right? He's only hearing this. So you have to understand how he's going to address them is going to directly reflect that. It's going to fit the context. It's going to be, you'll see it. It's amazing and it's absolutely accurate, okay? It's really cool. So it is in fact uncertain where they stand. Paul is going to start laying out his heart to a people he does not know. But they are his spiritual descendants in the hope that they will bear the family resemblance that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, right? That's the whole point of this book is he's trying to shape the family resemblance in them. He wants them to end up looking like Jesus Christ. That's what he wants, not like they are now. That's, what he, that's the whole point, Okay. And this is the great hope that's laid up before us 
being Laodicean Christians. This is our hope, that we'll bear the family resemblance, that we'll end up the right way. And that's the, that's the goal. And Paul can say these things directly to us. He, if he was here, he could preach the book of Colossians to us, and it would apply by the numbers. By the numbers. <clears throat> so our hope of each other, now get this, your hope of each other is the same. You have that same hope, right? You're hoping your brothers and sisters in Christ will bear the family resemblance. And when they don't, you smart for it. It hurts, right? So the best thing that we can be for each other is to be like Christ, is to bear that family resemblance. That's the best thing for us. We have fellowship only so far as we walk in the light. Look in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. Just a few pages over in my Bible. We have fellowship only so far as we walk in the light. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So if one of us is walking in darkness and not walking in the light, we have no fellowship. We're not buddies in the same boat. We're not dealing with the same things. You're singing off a different sheet. And so the issue is, is having that fellowship. But that's our hope of each other, right? We're hoping. So that's why we teach and admonish and do all the things that we do so that we'll all be buddies in the same boat that we will have that sweet fellowship that we're after. And if we walk in the light, there is a great hope of overcoming glory. There's a glory. Look back over there in Revelation again. Revelation chapter 3. See, there's, there's a promise. There's an exceeding precious promise like we talked about on Wednesday night that helps us escape the corruption that is in the world through, through lust. This is our great hope. Because he's given us a promise. Verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. There's the reigning that we talked about in Sunday school. Right? If you overcome, you'll sit with him. If you don't overcome, you will not sit with him. You understand? You won't, you won't have no authority. You'll have no reign. Because you're too, you were too busy not working for him now. But if you work for him now, you can expect to sit with him. So there's an overcoming hope that we're after. And this is what Paul is pr trying to deal with them on, is this hope. And that's what he's praying about. So the first thing we're going to look at is being thankful for our hope. And we are going to look at the context. Now, understand something. English is a derivative language. It comes from German, French, and Latin. Okay? There's there's three major influences on English and it's those three languages. Most of your nouns come from German. Most of your verbs and the uh, adjectives and the flowery things we put in them, they come from French and from Latin. And Latin also and Latin is uh, French is a Latin language as well. So it's kind of a double influence there. So understand what context means. Con in Latin means with. So it's with the text. It has to be with the text because if it's not with the text, it's out of the text. It's not a part of it. So this, this morning, you're going to learn about context and subtext because sub means below. So there's subtext that's going on in this text because he's going to imply some things by the things that he says and the things that he does not say. Okay, so there's going to be context, what it is saying, and there's going to be subtext, things that are implied by what he's saying. And that's what we're going to deal with. So first of all, we need to break down the sentence. Okay, that's a long sentence, ain't it? But really, the root of the sentence, the basic core thought is very simple. Look down here in Colossians chapter verse 1, verse 3. It says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the reality is, is the start of that sentence is we give thanks to God. Everything else is descriptive of that thanks. Then it says, praying always for you. Praying always is a subtext. 
It's not, the, it's not part of the main point. He says, we, but we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith. Well, that's how long we've been praying. Uh, your faith of Jesus Christ and love which you have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you. Now, that's the rest of the sentence, right? He says, we give thanks to God for the hope that is laid up for you. Everything else is window dressing. Everything else is descriptive of that. Now, it's all the word of God, and it's all meant to be taken seriously. But those descriptive items, if you were to strip them out to get to the core sentence, it would be that sentence. It would literally be, we give thanks to God for the hope which is laid up for you in the gospel. That's the sentence. They're saying he's giving thanks to God. And that is the main sentence. And notice the comma placement. Because notice he's not saying that he gives thanks for the Colossians. He doesn't know them. Right? Look at what it says there. It says in verse, in verse 3, he says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. If he was saying that they were that he was giving thanks for them, it would say that it was, it would say praying comma always for you. The comma would be moved. It wouldn't be there. That, that comma means that that is a parenthetical statement. It's part of what is, what is going on in the subtext that he's praying for them. So that's the, that's the breakdown. Okay. Look, and that's confirmed in chapter one and verse 27, because look at what verse 27 says to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What he's being thankful for is that if they're really saved, they have the hope of glory living inside them. And that's what he's thankful for. Because ultimately, what's going to be victorious in your life? Christ. The hope of glory. You can't trust in your flesh. He can't trust in the Colossians. The Colossians bring nothing to the table. Paul brought nothing to the table. He says, what, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He's being consistent. He's saying, listen, I thank God that you now have a hope that you didn't have before. Because that's what's going to come through. That's what's going to win out. And so that sentence is perfect as it sits. It is doctrine as it sits, right? He's not saying I'm thankful for you. He's not saying he's not thankful for them either. He is thankful, but the reality is, is they're their own worst enemy, right? He's thankful that, they, that Jesus Christ gave them the opportunity to be saved. That's what he's thankful for. Well, because that's the, that's the greatest thing that we have going is that he gave us the opportunity to be saved, that he gave us the opportunity to be delivered that he gave us the opportunity to walk with him. What an incredible thing. And just like we talked about in Sunday school, you just keep your head down, right? You keep your head down because your flesh, the works of your flesh, they're no friend of yours. Whatever you're good at is your worst enemy. What you're bad at also is not a, a plus. But what Jesus Christ is good at and what the Holy Spirit is good at that's your best blessing. That's what you've got going on. And that is the text that we're dealing with, okay? Uh, so the, the, the statement is plain. First of all, he is not saying that he's not thankful for them, but he can only be thankful about what he knows for certain. Right? Cursed be the man that trusteth in men, who makes his flesh his arm and whose heart departs from the Lord. That's, what, that's the testimony of the scripture from the beginning. By the way, that's Jeremiah chapter 17, where the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Same chapter. Okay? So understand, this is, the, this is what God has been telling man from the beginning. If you trust in yourself, you will fail. If you trust in me, you'll win. That's the, that's the key. That is the key from the beginning. Because he does not want any flesh to glory in flesh. But I'm getting ahead of myself. He can only be thankful for what he knows for certain. The reason he can't be as certain with them as he was, say, with the Thessalonians, for instance, is that he doesn't know them directly. Look in chapter 2 and verse 1 of Colossians. 
For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. Remember, this applies to both churches. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. He does not know them directly. He hadn't been there yet. I don't know if he ever got there. I, I haven't looked it up. But I don't know that he ever got there. But the reality is, is he's wrote a book to him, a book of the Bible to him. So he's got something to say to them, but he can't speak to them like he knows them personally from firsthand experience. Um, and by the way, this isn't suspicion or reservation on his part. See, you can be fully aware and fully realize what mankind is without being ugly to him, right? You can't expect more from a lost person they can come up with, right? You can't expect more from your flesh than it can come up with. It is what it is. You should be merciful as you can be as far as you can. But the fact is, the only person you can have certainty and confidence in is Jesus Christ. That's the one that you can be really certain of. And so his, his sentence is exactly that. He's not being suspicious. He's not being reserved. He is just not speaking out of turn. See, we love to flatter with our mouths, right? We love to give uh, flowery speeches to people and puff them up as if that's not destructive, as all the Scripture tells you it is. You can be nice, but you ain't got to shine people on, okay? Be nice, but don't lie. There's no reason to lie. Look in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 16. Proverbs 13, 16, and you're going to see this a hundred places in the book of Proverbs. If you read it, you're going to find it. He says, every prudent man dealeth with knowledge what he knows, but a fool layeth open his folly. He starts talking about things he has no experience with, right? He says, every, every prudent man deals with knowledge. You deal with what you know, not with not what you don't know. So t say what you know and not things that you don't know. Because it'll become apparent to everyone pretty soon. That's exactly what that's saying. He lays open his folly. You start talking about things you know nothing about, and about two minutes in, as uh, one of my wife's best friends, dad, her dad always used to say, you should have stopped talking about two sentences ago. <laughs> right? That's, that, that's about right. That's usually about how it is, because people start talking out of turn, and then you end up talking about things that you have no information on, you have no reality with. So look in chapter 14, Proverbs. In verse 15, Proverbs 14, 15 says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Listen, he can't just empty-headed believe everything that he's heard about them. He has to deal with them based on what he actually knows. Because up to this point, it's all rumor. Now, he may, Epaphras may be as trustworthy as the day is long and be telling him the absolute truth. But Paul doesn't know that for certain. Okay? So he has to deal with them how he can, by the Holy Spirit of God, deal with them. And the Holy Spirit of God will never ask you to contradict his word. And when he tells you to not to deal with knowledge, not with what you don't know, you can't do it a third way. There's no other way to do it. You do it the right way, not any wrong way. So people will object, right? Well, that doesn't seem like what we've been taught all these years, right? Look in Proverbs, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. They'll bring, they'll bring this out, which is an oversimplification, but it is what it is. We'll deal with it as it is in truth. People will object. 1 Corinthians 13, look at verse 4. This is the love chapter, the charity chapter. It says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, right? Did he say anything evil about them? No, he didn't. He knows you're evil, right? It's, it, it, you just, that's reality, right? But you're not supposed to go around just thinking evil of everything, Right? Look at what this says, verse, verse 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. You can't sin and say that you've done something, that you know something about somebody that you don't know. Well, I know you mean well. You may not mean well. Right? 
You may have meant it just as ugly as you could possibly mean it. Okay. Rejoice in iniquity. Rejoice not in iniquity. Rejoice in the truth. Look what it says. Beareth all things. Look at this. Believeth all things. Well, didn't it say there that the simple believeth every word, but the, but the, but the prudent looketh well to his going? Well, that's not what this is talking about. Believeth all things means believing all things that God says, not everything that everyone else says. Believeth all things is not some... In, in, uh, I always think of that phrase, cotton-headed ninny-muggins from a very silly movie. But it's, you, you, you meet people like this, and why are, why are they almost always Democrats? But they're just, they, they have this, this pie-in-the-sky view of the world that doesn't deal with reality, right? People are people. That doesn't mean you don't love them. That doesn't mean you don't want what's best for them. But they're people. They're sinners. They've got problems. They are their problem. Okay? So understand that that's what you're dealing with. And it's okay to deal with people and to deal with them in a positive fashion, but you can't trust them farther than what they can come up with. Right? Don't trust them any farther than what they can come up with, or else you will be disappointed. It is not, in fact, a contradiction, but a fulfillment of it. God's love knows that God can do anything. And he can do that within you and me. You catch that? Anything that he's done in me, he can do in you. I believe all things because I believe that he can do all things. You catch, you catch that? I don't believe in you. I don't believe in you at all. I believe in him in you. I trust him all the way. And if he's in you, you'll go all the way. You will go all the way. You catch that? That's what it means to believe all things. It doesn't mean to believe that everything's hunky-dory and perfect. It is not. Only a fool would think so and have to ignore the whole rest of the Bible. The reality is reality, but you can trust your God for everything. Look, look with me in Mark chapter 10 and verse 27. This is the testimony of the entire Bible. You've got to keep it in its context and not take it out of its context. Anything he has done in me and anything he has done in you, he can do in anyone else. You have to believe that. You have to consider the source when dealing with information. Right? Look at Mark chapter 10. Look at verse 27. And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. That is what it means to believeth all things. With God all things are possible. It is possible with God. With men, it is impossible. It is not possible. That's reality. So we need not to be a cotton-headed ninny muggins. We need to be somebody who deals soberly and righteously with knowledge, with truth of the facts. That doesn't mean you're not positive and gracious and encouraging. Far be it. You know the answer to how it could get done. You know how it'll work. it could work out. And it can get done. It can get done and it will get done the right way if God does it. Look in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 10. By the way, this is the way Paul talks in every one of his letters. Galatians. Chapter 5. Famously, Paul does not say that he is thankful for the Galatian church either. Now, the reason for that was he did know them and they were doing the wrong thing. So he did not say, I thank God for you. He wasn't sure that they were entirely saved, right? He wasn't entirely sure that they were saved because they were doing things that would witness the fact that they don't trust God's spirit to do it. They were trying to go back into the law. And so they were going to do it themselves. Uh, pardon me, 
That's not how a believer acts. That's not how a spirit-filled believer acts. They trust God with all things. That's the reality. Look in Galatians chapter 5, and look at how carefully he words this. Look at verse 10. He says, I have confidence in you through the Lord. See that? I have confidence in you through the Lord. Through your flesh, I have no confidence in you. None whatsoever. But in the Lord, yeah, I got confidence in you. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. If somebody's messing around and messing with the word of God and messing with that in your life, they'll bear their judgment. But if you've got Christ residing in you, I have confidence in you through the Lord. Because he'll bring, he'll bring it out. He'll take care of it. But if he ain't in there, you have no hope. And I have no hope of you. That's reality. That's exactly what Paul's dealing with. Philippians chapter 3. So that was the most negative book that Paul wrote. And look in Philippians, which is the most positive book that he wrote. And he says exactly the same thing. Because it's universal. Okay? Okay. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in who? In the Lord. That's who to rejoice in. You're not supposed to rejoice in the flesh. You rejoice in the Lord. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous. Hey, listen, just because I'm telling you to rejoice in the Lord, that doesn't make me upset that I have to tell you to rejoice in the Lord. That's what he's saying. He says, but for you, look at this, it is safe. That's dealing with knowledge, folks. Rejoice in the Lord. It's the only thing you've got to rejoice in. Rejoice in the Lord, not your 401k. Rejoice in the Lord, not the government. Rejoice in the Lord, not a talent, not an ability. Rejoice in the Lord, not in anything else. Rejoice in the Lord, because what, what, what are you rejoicing in beside that? Is idolatry. Rejoice in the Lord. Look at this, verse 2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Now he's dealing with the, the enemies that generally attack the body of Christ. He says, look at this, verse 3, he says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You can have no confidence in anyone's flesh. No one's. Your most trusted partner in anything that you do, you cannot trust their flesh. You can't have confidence in it. Well, I know what they'll do. No, you don't. No, you don't. The flesh is wicked, deceitful, above all things. Okay? We talked about it in Sunday school. The works of the flesh, they're these. By the way, did you notice there's 18 of them? Six plus six plus six. 18 works of the flesh listed in Galatians chapter 5. So understand what you're dealing with. We are the circumcision because we've been cut away from our flesh who rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You should not have any confidence in your flesh at all. No confidence in your flesh. Don't trust it any farther than you can throw it. And as she says on Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you shouldn't throw, with your bad knee, you shouldn't be throwing anyone. I've got a bad knee, I shouldn't be throwing anyone, much less myself. Look at 2 Corinthians. What a silly movie. Giant waste of time. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3. Look at what this says. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. Well, wait a second. Didn't he just say that we're not to rejoice in the flesh, to have no confidence in it? Isn't that, is that a contradiction? Look at what it says. Having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Well, huh, right there he says he's got confidence in them and he rejoices in them. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. Look at, look at chapter 7.
verse 13 to 16. He says, We therefore were comforted in your comfort, yea, the exceedingly more joyed because of the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Hey, they've got a good relationship. They were refreshed. He says, For if I have boasted anything of him to, uh, to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in the truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. The fact is he had been telling him what he knew about them, that he, that they could rejoice in them and that they would rejoice in them and that they would have joy in the Corinthians. Why? Because they were in fact saved and they bore proof of it in that they repented of their sins. You see that? You see what's going on there? Because remember, 1 Corinthians, he's raking them over the coals for this list of things that they're just as carnal as the day is long. And in 2 Corinthians, they got right. And he said, listen, I rejoice in you. But what is he rejoicing in? He's rejoicing in the fact that they let God have his way with them. That's what he's rejoicing in. He's not having confidence in their flesh. Because what? Look at, the, look at this verse 15. And this and his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how ye with fear and trembling you received him. They didn't want Titus coming to them mad at him and so they received him with fear and trembling knowing that they had blown it and that they needed to get right and that they wanted to be careful with how they dealt with him verse 16 says i rejoice therefore that i have confidence in you in all things why because proof is in the pudding proof is in the pudding they had proved it he could have confidence in them because he had seen their obedience he had seen them submit. He had seen them put their flesh down and exalt Jesus Christ in their life, whether they liked it or not. That's exactly how it went. And so he, could, he had proof of them that they were in Christ because they were willing to get right and willing to do right, even if it crossed them in a negative way. That's exactly the way, that's exactly the way it is. Proof is in the pudding. Proof is in the flame. Proof is proved out. And listen, proof goes both ways. I have to be proved. Paul had to be proved to them and they had to be proved to Paul. Understand, proof is in the pudding. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Keep going. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 1 to 9. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1 to 9 says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were, pre and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in, in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. You understand what he's saying there? He's saying, listen, you want to know the proof is the consistency of my message. It's going to be absolutely the same every time. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. If somebody's changing their tune every other week, don't you dare trust them. But if they've got a consistency that is godly, because that's how God speaks in the mouth of two or three witnesses, then guess what? You can have confidence what they're saying is true because it's consistent. You said they're looking for a proof of Christ speaking in me because they didn't. some of those guys still didn't trust him. Well, look at verse 4. He says, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. You want to know how he was going to be consistent? You want to know how he was going to have that power? Christ, not his flesh, because your flesh is flaky. My flesh is flaky. It doesn't do everything that it wants to do even. Even it wants to do the right thing and it doesn't. 
So when do you get that thing right and how do you do it right? It is Christ every time. It's his power in you that gives you that. That's the way it is. Verse, verse 5, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates? The only way you can prove yourself is if Jesus Christ is really in you. And then you will prove it out to be true, right? You will say, listen, I want to do what's right and I can't trust my flesh. And because I can't trust my flesh, I'll have to trust him. And when you trust him, you get the victory. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Because if you trust in your flesh, you get all the stuff that Scott talks about in Sunday school this morning. Variance, emulation, hatred, strife, sedition, backbiting, filthy communication coming out of your mouth. Right? You get all that ugly stuff that happens when your flesh gets its hackles up. Because what happens if you're doing it in your power, you've just empowered the wrong dog. That black dog's going to win. But you need to empower the white dog, the right one. You need to empower Christ in your life and let him have control. That's the reality, right? He says, <clears throat> except ye be reprobates, but I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. He says, listen, I've got the proof in my life. I know the power of Christ. He says, now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved. He says, listen, I don't care how it reflects on me at all. He says, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Even though you're doubting us all day long, you do what's right anyway, right? He says, he says verse 8, he says, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Even if you do something wrong, all you're doing is highlighting the truth. You realize that? If all the world is going the wrong way, all they're doing is highlighting the truth and going, mm, no, that ain't going to work. It doesn't matter how many people are doing it. That ain't going to work. It's not going to work. He says, he says this, verse 9, he says, For we are glad when we are weak, there's your flesh, and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. And by the way, that is exactly the prayer that he is praying for the church at Colossae. Look over there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. He says, Whom we preach, talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in the flesh. Is that what it says? It says perfect in Christ. You can't be perfect apart from him. So that's, how, that's what we preach is that you would be perfected in him. And he is being absolutely consistent. Even in the wording of a sentence and where he placed the commas. You see that? Even where he placed the commas. He didn't say, I'm thankful for you. He said, I have hope of you in Christ. That's exactly what he said. It's a, the consistency of Scripture is amazing. And the fact is, Laodicea needs to prove itself. Laodicea, which is us, needs to prove itself. We need to prove ourselves to be the children of God. Like we talked about, like we sang about this morning, child of the king, child of the king. If you are, prove it. Walk in truth. If you are, prove it. Love the truth. If you are, prove it so that we might all have confidence in you. That, that's the reality. Look in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 5. He says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. If you want to, if you want to know that you have Him and really have Him, He will have. He will give you consolation if you suffer with Him. If you suffer with Him, you'll reign with Him, right? We'll look at verse seven, and He says, "And our hope of you is steadfast." How, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. 
Listen, if you want to prove that you have a relationship with Christ, suffer and go through suffering with him. And you know what will happen? He will show up to comfort you and you'll know that you're his. You'll absolutely know. And if he doesn't show up to comfort you, you're not his. Because we know that if you suffer with him, he will, he will be there for your consolation. We know it. He'll be, he'll be there and he'll show up. If you've got to run to a bottle, maybe you're not his. If you're looking for comfort, the southern comfort kind, that ain't the right comfort. You need to go to him for comfort. So now let's make sure the subtext, right? We've talked about the context. Now let's make sure that we hear the subtext. What Paul is saying by not saying things and saying what he said is, I hear that you're bringing forth fruit or want to bring forth fruit, the right fruit. It rejoices my heart to hear it, right? He says, I hear you're bringing forth fruit and it rejoices my heart to hear it. I hear it, but I want you to prove it. That's what he's saying. He says, I hear it. I hear it. He says, knowing that God can do it in you. I know God can do it. If you really have him, I know he can do it. He can do it. That's what he's saying. My hope of you is steadfast if you keep going with him. Look over in Hebrews. This is exactly the same message you see over here in Hebrews. Because here these people are called Hebrews, which are supposed to be the people of God. They're supposed to be trusting in Christ, the Messiah that they were looking forward to all that time. But he ain't sure that they're all Hebrews, really. He's not sure they're really Jews in their hearts like we talked about last week. You know, you, you, you've got to understand that there's an inward truth that has to be there if you're going to really be the thing that you're called to be. It has to be on the inside, not just on the outside. And Hebrews, look at this, chapter 6, look at what he says. Verse 7. He says, for the earth, he's going to use the example of the world around you that you see every day. For the earth, which drinketh in the rain, rain is a type of the word of God, that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. Listen, when your, when your earth, your body that's made out of earth, by the way, receives the word of God and the judgment of God as it is in truth, the word of God, you receive blessing from God. Because you'll bring forth the right fruit. If you receive it like it's supposed to be received, then praise the Lord. But if you reject it and you harden your heart, what happens? Verse 8, but that which beareth thorns and briars. You know, thorns are picture the riches and the cares of this life. And briars are your thorny, your, your, uh, your objections to what God would have you to be. He that, that it says that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. God rejects that, is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. You think he's kidding. He's not kidding. Verse nine, but beloved, look at this. We are persuaded better things of you. He says, listen, I think, I think I've got a better idea that you're not going to be like a thorn or a briar. You're going to bring forth the right kind of fruit. It's exactly the same thing he's to the, saying to the Colossians. He says, I, I have confidence in you. Look at this, and things that accompany salvation. Listen, if you are really saved, you're going to bring forth the right fruit. You've got it. If you're really saved, it will prove itself out. It will come forth of them all. That's, that's the reality. He says, he says there, though we thus speak. He says, listen, I'm warning you because I ain't sure all of you are all right. I'm warning you because you need to be bringing forth the right fruit because it does accompany salvation. These things accompany salvation. It brings forth the right fruit, okay? Look down here, look at, the, look at the next verse, verse 10. He says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. He says exactly the same thing to that Colossian church. He says, listen, you, it, I hear that you have love toward all the saints. Hey, I'm hearing you're bringing forth the right fruit, guys. That's great. God is not unrighteous to forget that. God will reward that. We talked about that in Sunday school. You will inherit the kingdom. Look at verse 11. He says, and we desire 
that every one of you do, set, do show the same diligence, right? There's the issue. You have to continue to be diligent with it. If you're going to be careless with it, you're going to lose it. Not your salvation, but the reward. He says, to the end of, to the end, excuse me, you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So the question is, is whose hope is being assured, right? Whose hope is being assured there? Is it Paul's hope for them that they would do the right things? Yes, it is. Is it their hope that they would end up the right way? Yes, it is. Full assurance means full assurance for everybody. See, you have to understand that we are an encouragement or a discouragement to each other. You understand that? How you act and how you live either encourages your brothers and sisters or it discourages them. The assurance of hope is a confidence that is shared by all. Right? It's a confidence that's shared by all, knowing that if you're letting Christ have his way with you, you will come out the other side the right way. And that's what our hope is. That's what we're all hoping in. And we hope it for you. We want you to be that, that way. Keep going here. He says, full of assurance of hope to the end that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You've been given an opportunity to receive grace and glory, virtue and glory. You've been called to that. You've given, been given promises to assure you that if you do what you're called to do, you will get it. You will get it. His word will not return unto him void. It won't return void. So do what you're called to do. It's not just an anchor for your soul. You understand that? Hope is not just an anchor for your soul alone, but an anchor to those who are leading you and those who you will lead. You understand? Every person's a leader. You understand that? Because everybody looks at everybody else and sees which direction you're going. So you're leading somewhere. Where are you leading? Where are you leading them to? And that's our hope is that you're leading them the right way. All you need to see, excuse me, they all need to see you being sure and steadfast. Look down here, verse, uh, verse 18. He says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we, that we might have, <clears throat> impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. See, we have fled to him to gain a refuge. We want him to help us. And that's the hope that is laid before us. And look at what this says, verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. It's the thing that keeps you going the right way. The hope of glory. The fact that someday I'm going to inherit glory with and sit in Christ's throne with him. That I'm going to overcome and win because he's placed it in me to do it and I want to do it. You see what we're after here? We want to end up the right way. We want to finish what we've started. We want to go to glory fully receiving what we could have had. Right? That's the issue. He says, which hope we have is an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. And then look at this. And which entereth into that within the veil. When was the last time you got a prayer answered? When was the last time God answered your prayers? What, how many times has he answered your prayers that you didn't ask? And gives you something you didn't know was coming. You're like, whoa. Hey, that's what it means to enter into that within the veil. That means you got your prayer heard, even the one you couldn't articulate. You got your prayer heard. He heard it and answered it. Yeah, man. That's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. Because then you know you have the hope that's set before you. You've got it. You just have to show the same diligence unto the end. Because that's what Paul's telling the Colossian church to do. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. <clears throat> Everybody needs to see you getting your prayers answered. So don't hide your fellowship and your faith. And most of all, don't fake it. You know, people say, fake it to make it. Don't you dare fake it. It needs to be real. Are you a stranger to your pastor? 
Do I get to know you as much as I ought to know you? I ought to. Are you a stranger to your spiritual children? Right? To those people around you that you're supposed to be leading. Are you a stranger to them? Can they not look into every area of your life and see the hope in your life, in every area of your life? Are you transparent? Is your leadership at arm's length? Now, sometimes it is because of circumstance, right? Sometimes it is simply because of circumstance. You can't be there. Paul, they were, they were at arm's length with Paul because he'd never been there. They were at arm's length. Sometimes it's just circumstantial. And so you're kind of at a distance from them. And you can't, really, you can't really know them. But most of the time, it's because you're afraid of holiness. Now, here's the thing. And we get this all the time. You're in, you're in the store, especially as a pastor. You're in the store, and you see someone from your congregation. And you see them, but they don't know that you saw them. And all of a sudden, they take off and run the other way. It happens all the time. Why? And Rachel talked about how one time they were out having lunch one time, and their pastor, and they had, a, they had a huge church, so they didn't, you know, they, they knew their pastor, but they didn't know him, know him. And he was sitting in a booth with his wife having lunch at another table over here. Now, if he just saw them, he'd have come up and talked to them and, and all that kind of stuff. But Rachel said she was mortified that he might come over and talk to them. Not because she was uh, ashamed of him, but just that, no, that's the pastor. He can't come over here. Come on. He's a, he, He's wearing pants, not a robe, right? He ain't a priest trying to be aloof from you. He's a dude. He's a dude who loves you and wants and hopes for what's best for you, right? And so that's the reality. So don't be a, if you're, you see a, a pastor out, even from a pastor in another church, go talk to him. Say, hey, tell him you're, tell him how you're doing spiritually. That would be the greatest encouragement to them to know that you're doing well in the Lord, and that you're growing. Man, hey finish well and that's our hope that's all our hope that's what we pray for that's what we pray for week in week week out day out that you get it that you'd grow that you become perfect in christ jesus that's what we want that's that's what we live literally what we live for is to perfect you in christ jesus that's my whole reason for living you get it you get it so man that that's that's what that's what you're, you're after it's funny, you, and you see him all the time, right? I had a, a biker dude live next door to me, right? And I'm talking about he was a one percenter, okay? You guys know who the one percenters are? It's like the Hell's Angels, right? Murderers, killers. You try and leave the gang, they kill you. Once you're in, you're in for life. He was a one percenter. I can't remember the gang, but he had the, he had the colors and everything that he wore on his jacket and... But he knew that I was a pastor. And so they'd be out there with his buddies drinking and working on motorcycles. And I'd step outside and he'd yell him, shh, stop cussing. He's a pastor. Come to church. What are you doing? Right? If you know better, do better. If you know better, do better. I don't care if you're a one percenter. Get saved and come to church. The reality is if you know it's wrong... Stop doing it. And if it's right, get with those who are right and stay right. Don't be ashamed to have fellowship and walk in the light. That's the issue. Walk in the light. Stop hiding in the dark. What are you running from? Your, you know, and you find it all the time. You know, you see, you see somebody at the store and they just happen to show up at church the next Sunday. They ain't been there in six weeks. But they, you know, why? Because they know they ought to be there. They know they ought to be. Stop living in guilt. Stop living in guilt. If you're doing the right thing, do the right thing the right way all the time. And don't, don't fret about that other stuff. Don't mess with that other stuff. It's just thorns and snares designed to drag you down. Just free yourself from it. Just get rid of it. Free yourself of it. We know the same father and the same brother. We are all members one of another. All right. Let's talk about being realistic in prayer. You know, the fact is, I don't think we're going to get there. We're going to talk about the subtext next week because the doctrinal subtext goes into how to pray for each other, right? He's praying for them already that they would grow and that they would be perfected. 
that they would be what they're supposed to be, but he ain't too sure about them yet. Okay, the proof is in the pudding. And so he can't say more than he can say. But he knows what will work. He knows what will work in their life because it's worked in his life. And so don't be shy with the truth and don't hide. Go on to perfection because we are members one of another. Your hope is my hope. You get that? And my hope is your hope. If I'm doing right and I continue to do right, that should encourage you. And if you're doing right and continue doing right, that encourages me. And we need to keep being a good influence on each other. Keep being an encouragement to each other. Keep growing. Keep being perfected. You know, don't mark through the period in your Bible so that you can rightly divide the thing right. Right? Learn from me. I mean, make the notes in your Bible, but make sure you're watching out for that punctuation. That'll bite you. But the, all of these things are designed to encourage us. Hey, listen, we all do stuff. We all mess stuff up. But you know what? You keep growing. You keep growing. And don't ever stop. And don't ever stop. And if there's something glaring in your life that you just can't get over, come to us. We'll help you. He got over stuff in our lives. If there's something just massive in your lives that you just don't know how to deal with, come talk to me. Come talk to one of the deacons. We, we live for this stuff, literally. Literally live for this stuff. It's our life. And by the way, you get good enough at it, you just might become one of those things too someday. You might become a deacon. You might become a pastor. Because God has just trained you up to the place where it's your turn to take over. It's your turn. Okay, now you've got it. You've been perfected enough in Christ Jesus, and now you can start to lead others. And that's our hope. That is our hope. We're looking forward to that because someday we're going to rule and reign together with him. We're going to sit in the same seat and be overcomers. So next week we'll talk about being realistic in prayer right? That doesn't mean being pessimistic in prayer. That means being realistic. You can't pray for somebody like they're a saved person if they ain't saved, okay? And if they ain't saved, you can pray that they would get saved. And you ought to pray that they would get saved. That's a prayer according to God's will. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's be dismissed. Let's